Let's cross off the obvious questions you have. I didn't invent, find, or use a time machine. Nobody came back to summon me to fulfill a glorious destiny. Everything happens totally by accident, and to be honest, part of the reason I'm writing this all down is to put the pieces together myself. To make sense of it a bit, you know. It started when Bill, my husband, and I purchased the dusty old Maritime Museum. Quaint place, one of those little time capsules of a small town's local history. We'd moved to the coast for a better life. Our marriage is legal in our home state, sure, but the court of public opinion still isn't sold. We figured it'd be easier to set up roots where we could hold hands, bar the staring. The place was a steal, too. Came with all the exhibits, a ready-to-run business, family-owned until we signed the deeds. Previous owner was the last of the line, apparently. Either that, or none of the old codger's distance gray nephews or nieces wanted it. Maybe they knew. We hadn't planned to keep running it as a museum, of course. This prime slice of commercial real estate we'd envisioned as becoming the most uh, gram-worthy coffee place on the boardwalk. We wanted that influencer-powered spring breaker money. I'm not going to be dramatic and say things like we should have known or it was too good to be true, because we had no way to, and it wasn't. Yes, the place was a steal. It wasn't daylight robbery, though. We didn't get the place for free from Bill's long-lost creepy uncle or anything cliché like that. It was cheap, but not curse-haunting or previous tenant-murdered cheap. There was no reason to think buying that quaint little local museum was an invitation for paranormal shenanigans like, well, like whatever it was that just happened in the basement. Nobody told us the place had one. It wasn't on the layout plans or in the extensive read beggy write up of the property we got from the realtor. We were sitting through the remaining maritime bric a brac when I found the trap door. It was almost invisible. A square of faint grooves hidden just behind the massive model of a fishing ship. I thought the thing was ugly, personally, but Bill insisted we keep it. The model boat, that is. All the actually important historical stuff had been donated to proper museums already, leaving us with only the various waxworks and dioramas to work with for decoration. The ship was Bill's favorite. Well, uh, to be more accurate, the long tentacled kraken thing rising from the waves to devour it were. Horrible looking things, if you ask me. Uh, Bill didn't ask, but I told him anyway. I found his taste for old horror movies and the macabre entertaining, especially around Halloween, but still, I protested about keeping the ship. Look at it, William. It's horrid. Nobody wants that in the background of their story. We're going for pirate shanties and bubble tea, and not Davy Jones and freezing seawater. He just laughed at that. Look at it, Benjamin. It's kish. They'll love it. It's got Pirates of the Caribbean vibes coming out the wazoo. Those tentacles have human teeth glued to them, Bill. Yeah, but they're milk teeth. They're probably not from dead people. But probably. The excuse didn't really wash, but this place was Bill's baby, and so, ultimately, I knew I'd oblige. Full disclosure here, I was much more interested in the sunsets and mojito side of the move than the running a business bit. Bill, though, Bill was like a kid with a new video game about the commercial venture aspect. I decided weeks ago to show interest but stay out of the way. That's why I ended up helping him lift the heavy glass case containing the painted wood, clay, resin, twine, and human teeth. It was big. The ship itself was easily two feet long, and the glass case that contained it came up to Bill's shoulders, meaning it was well overhead height for me. Damn thing weighed a ton. If it hadn't been so... so off-putting, I'd probably have agreed with him about incorporating it into the decor. The level of craftsmanship was phenomenal. Despite my distaste, I had to give credit to the fact that I knew I was looking at somebody's life's work. There was something about it, though. Something that rubbed me up the wrong way. It wasn't just the sight of a sea monster with human teeth, either. It was a little too realistic for my tastes, I think. 
Plus, for some reason, the model maker had decided to include a historically inaccurate figure amongst the sailors. I remember pointing this out to Bill, wondering aloud why there was a kid in skinny jeans and a hoodie standing on the deck with 19th century seamen. Our guess was that the out-of-time figure was a little joke on the part of the artist, or maybe someone they knew included as some kind of pseudo-gesture. Even though they were only a few inches tall, the level of detail on their face was harrowingly accurate. I found out just how accurate a little while after we learned what the tooth kraken diorama concealed. The trapdoor was so well hidden that I thought I'd accidentally dislodged a floorboard when I tripped over one of its edges. Ah, oh, shit. Bill, mind your feet. I stumbled and felt the weight of the diorama case leave my grasp. It only had a few inches to drop, but the heavy thud was so loud, a few precarious balanced trinkets fell from their perches. Jesus Christ, Benny, what were you doing? Luckily, the heavy display missed Bill's toes, but not by much. If he'd been half an inch closer, we'd have spent the night in A&E. We only bickered for a few short minutes before I bent down to inspect the trap door. A short conversation about not realizing we had a basement later, and Bill was prying it open with the crowbar from our van. We could hear the moaning the moment it swung open. Bill, I, I think there's someone- Shh. I hear it too. There were cries coming from down there. A man's sobs, deep and ragged and pained. A tingle of adrenaline burst through me. My mind was racing through every story I'd ever read about squatters living in wall cavities or violent junkies taking up shelter in the cellars of abandoned buildings. I fretted over the morning news, of the headlines that would say things like newly local couple butchered in grisly double homicide. My husband's response to the noise turned my stomach almost as much as the whales themselves. Bill nodded to me, and, despite my protest, descended the ladder into the dark. I peered down the trap door. He was standing in a small room, shining around the flashlight on his cell phone. There's a strange room down here, Benny. I think it's unlocked. He stepped out of view of the trap door, and a moment later, I heard the creaking of heavy wood on rusted hinges. The soft whimpering grew significantly louder. William Croker, you get back up here right now. We're calling the police. His shouts echoed back from somewhere beyond my field of view. No need to call the cops, Benny. It's probably just some lost homeless guy. He's crying for God's sake. Let me deal with it. I don't want to be responsible for yet another unarmed man being shot because of white fragility. I rolled my eyes, drowning out Bill's virtuous rants about the dangers of law enforcement. I loved that he cared about all that stuff, but finding out there's a stranger living on the property you've just purchased is not the time. After a minute or so, Bill's echoes quieted to silence. I was alone with the trap door, peculiar maritime oddities, and distant sounds of suburban traffic. It took me about three minutes to go from, as usual, I think something's wrong, to... Okay, I may not be being my usual paranoid self. Something might actually be wrong here. After four, I was shout-whispering down the hole. Bill. Bill. What's going on down there? No response. I sat for ten more long seconds, straining my ears to hear any sign of my husband. None came. The only sounds wafting up from the open trap door were these soft sobbing. I gulped, every hair on my body straightening to attention. My intrusive imagination started a slideshow of terror, of the man I loved maimed and mutilated in the thousands of ways characters in his horror movies snuffed it. Another agonizing, lengthy ten seconds later, I was doing something incredibly stupid. I should have called the cops, right? I didn't, though. I respected Bill's sanctimonious instruction too much. So what did I do? I climbed down the ladder. Idiot. My screams when I saw the skull were so loud that more bric-a-brac clattered on the floorboards upstairs. I turned my phone's flashlight on before I descended, holding it in my mouth as I navigated the steel rungs in the dark. My hands were shaking when I got to the bottom. 
Typical klutzy Benny. What did I do? I dropped the damn thing. After bending down to fumble around on the dirty ground for a few moments, I found it, picked it up, and turned around. There, a few inches from my face, was a lipless, bony grin. Like I said, I screamed. I nearly fell back onto my ass. It took me several deep, shaking breaths to realize the empty sockets leering down at me didn't belong to a specter, ghoul, or some other apparition. No. Opposite the ladder, through the open door marked Storage, Management Only, was a skeleton hanging in a glass case. An anatomical display for physicians from way back when. You know the sort. The one that cartoons taught us all doctor's offices had. I was so embarrassed that I almost forgot why I had come down here in the first place. The still uninterrupted wailing from the shadows beyond the grinning skull made sure it was only almost, though. I gulped, clinging to my fears for Bill's safety as motivation to penetrate the shadows of the storage room. The secret space was much larger than the building above. It stretched back much further than my feeble phone flashlight could reach. A semi-cavernous space with a lofty, distant ceiling bordered by high cinder block walls. I kept shout-whispering for Bill as I crept through the narrow alleys and passageways between the piles of stored exhibits. Never did I hear a response, or anything, save for the progressively louder wails from the maniac I couldn't help but picture hacking Bill to pieces. Well, at first I couldn't help panicking over such mental images. As I got further into the storage room, I started to take notice of the exhibits, though. By the time I actually found Bill, I was so lost in trying to make sense of them that I nearly tripped over him. As I said, I'm still trying to piece all this together myself. This happened about three hours ago, I think. Maybe four, from your perspective, at least. I can't recall everything that's down there, but I'll try to remember what I can. I need to, even if the details end up hazy. I think it'll help give what happens to Bill and me some perspective. Neither of us had ever really believed in the supernatural, paranormal, or any of that, as I thought until a few hours back, rubbish. We weren't staunch skeptics, but by the same token, our general outlook was that 99.999% of it all was explainable. I doubt there are any explanations for some of the things hidden beneath our affordable slice of a happy future. The first few exhibits I saw were odd and borderline unsettling, but nothing I would be writing about out of context. I'll give you an example. Directly behind the mocking skeleton was a wooden pallet, the kind forklift drivers use their aforementioned forklifts to move about. On this particular pallet were a dozen or so rectangular stone blocks. Each was no taller than my shin, and none would have been remarkable at all were it not for the intricate hieroglyphs. They were like none I recognized, although admittedly I'm no archaeologist. I'm pretty sure I never heard of any ancient civilization that carved depictions of themselves as lizard people, though. The reptilian figures were carved into every stone, more often than not shown throwing spears at groups of taller figures, figures that were very clearly meant to be human. There was also the figure with an ear for a face, appearing on several of the stones, this third symbol, uh, character, unsettled me. Not so much because its entire head was an ear. No. It unsettled me because the hieroglyphs were clearly thousands of years old. Reptilian figures and ear faces could be explained away with tribal imagination. The fact that the ear head was wearing a grey suit, complete with a black tie, couldn't. Many of the artifacts close to the doorway were of a similar nature. Dozens of rusted devices that looked modern in design, piles of time-corroded relics so complex their purpose defined understanding. It wasn't until I'd been walking for a minute or two, still following the moans and calling for Bill, that the exhibits inspired greater emotion than mere unease. At some points, an eight-foot fish tank containing a red book suspended in clear resin blocked my path, forcing me to duck left between a cloth-covered cabinet and a stack of dusty crates. I turned the corner 
and screamed once more. The rim of my jittering phone light had caught the edges of something. Something long, pink, nail-tipped, and fleshy. Fingers. It was when my beam traveled up the arm they were attached to that I yelled. The feeble glow from my phone should have found a chest attached to that limb. It didn't. I had to take a step or two back and blink a few times before I could fully make sense of what I was seeing. I was looking at a suit. I didn't figure it was a suit at first, though, and it was understanding the suit aspect that pushed me squarely into Nopeville. The skin of the fingertips I'd caught was a dull, peach-colored, rubbery stuff. Not latex. It looked more like skin than latex, but not enough like skin to fool the senses. The figure had all its limbs. Arms, legs, even the neck were all intact. It was the head and chest that meant I had to stop for a double take. The chest and torso were open. A vertical slit ran down from the base of the throat to the Ken doll smooth crotch. The rubbery flesh pulled apart like curtains. Inside was an angular skeletal structure made of dark, iron-like metal. It was vaguely human, but only in the places where the structural utility of the human skeleton made sense. There were no superfluous nubs of bone, and no excessively complex joints. Also, not gonna lie, I didn't think any human being had an assortment of miniature valves, knobs, and levers on their spinal cord. I'm also pretty darn certain no person on Earth has a small chair in their skull. The head of the figure was split vertically, much like the torso. However, this split ran through iron bone as well as plastic skin. The opposing hemispheres were suspended on either side of the neck on several brass pistons, each no longer or thicker than a knitting needle. Surrounding the opening to the iron cylinder spine was a plethora of more dials, widgets, and buttons. It was the chair at their center, a small iron cup-shaped seat that drew the most of my attention. There was something in it, a sagging, pus-colored thing that looked like a halfway point between a slug and a starfish. I screamed because this thing was... It was breathing. Slow, ragged breaths. Breaths so clear I could hear the pain and labor required to make them. That was the point I made an executive decision for Bill and me. I swore to myself that when I found him, we were getting out of this place. And then we were selling it. No amount of coastal happiness would be a worthwhile trade-off for whatever we stumbled into. Speaking of stumbling, I did that as fast as I could away from the wheezing creature in the non-fictional mansuit. I don't think thankfully is quite the right word, but the whimpering in the distance hadn't stopped. I was weirdly relieved, though only because it meant finding my direction again was no issue. Somehow, I knew that wherever I found the sobbing man was where I'd also find Bill. I was right about that, sadly. I was also right about there being nothing sunsets and margaritas could bring worth what we'd unwittingly inherited when we shook hands and accepted keys. For the first time ever, I hate being right. I was fumbling my way through cramped darkness and dusty shadows for at least ten minutes. For context, you could walk the length of the museum in about twelve seconds with a spring in your step. The oddities I was passing were truly in the realms of disturbing by this point. Any of them would have rattled my absent-minded wandering thoughts for weeks. I didn't just see one, though. I saw... Jesus, I'm not going to be okay, am I? There were paintings so horrific that several made me mumble, No, please no, under my breath. One was so bad that it only took a brief glimpse for me to stop running and cough up my lunch. Seriously, my flashlight was on it for barely a tenth of a second and I was puking. It was a person, of what gender it was impossible to tell. Why? Because the figure in the portrait had no face. Atop the neck, in the immaculate oil painting, was a glistening mass of gore and bone. 
So talented was the painter that the phone light seemed to glisten and dance on the exposed muscles and dripping sinnoh. Like I sat, I only caught a glimpse. One split-second glance was enough for me to be on my knees, throat burning as bile and half-digested sushi forced their way from my stomach. Let's talk about that, shall we? A painting of a jawless, eyeless, skinless face is a grisly thought, yeah? It's not instant vomit grisly, though. I don't think Bill and I would have lasted long if I was that squeamish. There was something wrong about that painting. Something unnatural that both my mind and body rejected with zero hesitation. Even writing about it now is making me a little queasy. Just being honest. I forced myself to keep the light on the ground after that. Every so often, though, my arm would jolt, or I'd forget myself and sweep the beam over some fresh monstrosity. I was in tears before long, though I don't know which specific exhibits got them going. It could have been the aquarium tank full of dead men. No, that's not right. It wasn't dead men. It was a dead man. A dozen or so copies of the same man's corpse, floating in clear blue liquid. A long, thin, wrinkled old face, repeated over and over again with varying shades of pain, anger, and relief. Still, I might have been crying by the time I saw that. My panic might have risen to hysterics level when I made the mistake of finding the eye in the little black box. The one that moved and followed me. The one that fell to the ground with a wet splat and scattering of organic mess with my klutzy elbow knocking it from its shelf. Ignoring the parade of aberrations got harder and harder the longer I hurtled onward. I kept running toward the sobs, toward where I knew Bill would be. My feet weren't pounding in the dark much longer. The taste of vomit was still fresh when I felt the tug at my ankle. What the hell? Bill? I'd been going so fast by that point that skittering to a halt had me damn near crashing into another stack of dust-coated crates. Bill was lying on the floor, sprawled at the opening to a clearing amongst the piles of unspeakable objects. I didn't need my phone flashlight anymore. So long was I in my panic that I didn't register the flicker of the trash can fire until after I felt Bill's hand crawling at my pants leg. Shortly after I became aware of the faint orange glow, the stench hit me. Whoever these trespassers were, they'd been here a while. Several weeks at least, judging from the pungency of the human waste odor and smoky grilled rat's aroma. Oh, and you heard that right. It was trespassers. Plural. Both were men no further along in life than their late twenties. As soon as I saw them, I had my explanation for the sobbing. One of them, the one furthest from Bill and I, had a face that gleamed with the wet slick of tears. He was bawling like a toddler, curled up in the fetal position on a retro-looking orange living room chair, hugging his knees so his bare feet didn't touch the cold granite floor. His back and forth rocking was so vigorous that the wooden chair legs scraped and scratched on the ground. The other figure, the one standing on one side of the flaming trash can and dead rat spit, drew the most of my attention, however. He was no doubt wondering why yet another intruder had stumbled into their makeshift camp. I was wondering what he'd done to Bill that meant my husband's eyes were rolling back in his skull and his jaw wouldn't stop grinning. I can't remember which of us acted first. I know we both lunged, though. I wasn't He-Man. I was a slave in the Roman gladiator pit charging at a hungry lion because the 0.001% of survival was still their best chance at seeing another morning. The way he came at me was very different. There was no fear, no panic or terror. The way he moved was determined, practiced, predatory. The quote-unquote fight was over before it started. One moment I was in the air, and the next the darkness was getting darker in time with waves of hot pain from the base of my skull. The dull ache hadn't abated when I came to. 
Ethan, Ethan, please don't. Just leave them, Ethan. The sobs pleading roused me pretty sharpish. The events leading up to being knocked out cold came flooding back. The trap door, the sobbing, the things in the basement, the trash can fire, Bill. Oh God, my first coherent thoughts set. Bill, I've got to find Bill. Trying to stand let me know that my assailant had tied me to a chair. My vision was still blurry, so I couldn't make sense of my surroundings at first, but every second brought more focus. I soon realized that I'd been moved deeper into the bowels of the museum storage, away from their makeshift camp. To my relief, I could see Bill, although that relief quickly gave way to concern. He wasn't moving. Bill. Bill. I swear to God, if you've heard, shut up. My half-screamed threat was cut short by a palm slamming into my left cheek. The smack of skin on skin hanged around the cramped shadows, and to my shame, I found myself obeying the command. That's better. The man that slapped me was the same predatory figure I'd been overpowered by back at the trash can fire clearing. There were a few more trash can fires in this new, larger space, and the increase in light allowed for a better look at him. Tired was the first word that sprang to mind. The face hovering inches from my own held eyes so bloodshot that the pupils looked as though they were set into two scrunched up balls of post-nosebleed tissue paper. The bags under them were the deep brown purple of an old bruise, and I could smell the dryness of his mouth on his rancid breath. I didn't have to know a thing about this man to know that he hadn't slept in days. Ethan, Ethan, please leave them alone. The second round of tear-choking begging had me looking over Ethan's, I'm assuming, shoulder. His companion, the one I'd last seen rocking up on the orange 70s living room chair, was sitting on the floor a few feet away from Bill. Thanks to the multiple trash can fires here, I could see this man's features clearer too. You know that cliché expression about feeling the color drain from your face? It doesn't feel so cliché once you experience it yourself. I recognized the tear-stained face, you see. In the brighter orange haze, I realized where I'd seen it before. I couldn't mistake that face, despite the fact that the last time I'd seen it, it was when it was attached to a wooden body about two inches tall. I knew that sobbing man. He was the out-of-time figurine from the human-toothed sea monster display. That wasn't the only thing I could work out about him. His words carried the telltale bending of the hearing impaired, which would have been obvious anyway with the visible hearing aids. This man looked tired, too, but not anywhere near the same level as Ethan. There were several bruises around his lips, eyes, and across his arms. Whatever kind of relationship these two shared wasn't a happy one. The power dynamic here was obvious. Even though I didn't know the sobbing man from Adam, I could tell instantly that I was this Ethan character's third, not second, captive. I'll be honest, though. I wasn't too concerned with how he found himself down here with this madman. I was still trying to comprehend the fact there was a miniature version of him on the antique model ship upstairs. Y you I heard myself mumbling, unable to look away from him. You were the one on the ship. He was, but he can't hear you. Ethan was standing above me, smirking. The mask took his hearing. Do you know sign language? I shook my head, no. Ethan shrugged. Me neither. I've been writing stuff down for him on a notepad. We seem to be getting on okay. You don't really care, though, do you? I found my head shaking again before I could stop it. Thankfully, the maniac didn't take offense. Instead, he laughed. Which, in hindsight, might actually have been worse. It was a shrill laugh, a barely audible titter that my eardrums could find no way to make palatable. <laughs> no, I wouldn't care if I was tied to a chair. Why would you? You're tied to a chair. But the only thing you care about right now is how to not be tied to a chair, right? I struggled against my bindings once more. 
They were tight, tight enough that it only took three or four strains against them for my ankles and wrists to protest. I glared at the madman towering over me and tried my best to mask the machine gun hammering of my pulse. What? What are you doing here? I stammered. What have you done to Bill? What's going- Another skin-on-skin -skin crack, this time against my right cheek. No questions from you, only from me. I'm guessing Bill's that guy on the floor, yeah? I nodded, ashamed at the prickling coming from the corners of my eyes. Ethan's smirk widened. Cool, thought so. Bill's fine. Well, fine's a bit of a stretch. He's not dead, since that's what I'd be worried about in your position. You worried he's dead? I found myself nodding again. The prickling was a warmth now. Two long trails of hot moisture framing my cheekbones. Yeah, I thought so. Well, like I said, he's not. But, like I also said, you're not the one who gets to find stuff out. He pinched one of my cheeks and gave it a few tugs, just like an overbearing uncle with a bewildered infant. I'm the question guy here, a friend of Bill. First one, what are you doing here? I blinked a few times, taken aback by the audacity of the question. What am I doing here? You and Bill, yeah. What are you both doing down here? We own the place. Do you? Ethan's smirk faltered a little. He was genuinely surprised by the news. What happened to the old man? Did he die? Uh, yes, although I don't see... Ethan ignored me, clicking his tongue a few times before rambling on. That's a shame. A real shame. That makes things a bit tricky. For you and Bill, I mean... And not for Riley and me. We're close. So close. Six months down here with the mask and we're so damn close. Did Mr. Pembroke know you were down here? I was a little surprised to hear the words flutter from my lips. So was Ethan. Were my slaps not hard enough? No questions from you. His roar was so loud that, for a harrowing life flashing before eyes instant, I thought he was about to snap my neck. He grabbed me by the shoulders. The grip was so tight that long, unwashed fingernails broke skin through my shirt, causing small scarlet clouds to bloom on the fabric. No questions from you. This isn't about you, friend of Bill. This isn't your story. It's ours. Me and Riley. Riley and me. Well, not ours. I'm an extra, too. Mainly it's his. I was so relieved to feel the stinging claw pressure on my left shoulder release. Ethan pointed at the sobbing deaf man behind him, the Riley whose story I'd been accused of trespassing on. Once more, I was listening to an incredulity I felt far too terrifying to possess, leaving my lips. What? What the hell are you talking about? Are you high? Is that what this is? Did Mr. Pembroke let you use this place to... Another slap. Shut up, friend of Bill. This is the last warning, okay? Last. But yeah, the old man let us stay down here. Drugs, though. <laughs> Drugs. I wish. No, 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 friend of Bill. I think for this to make sense, you need to see. You need to know. Ethan walked behind me, and I heard the sound of a bag being unzipped. Riley, who'd been watching the scene unfold, started wailing louder than ever before. Ethan, please, no, don't. Please don't, Ethan. Just leave it in the bag. Look what it did to the first one. Ethan... Ethan. Ethan carried on rambling as though oblivious to his friend's protest. We broke in here, you see, a while back now. Well, we broke in up there, and not down here. We found it here by accident. Funny things, aren't they? Accidents. 
His semi-nonsense was whispered into my left ear by the end of the last sentence. He was standing directly behind me, one hand again placed on my right shoulder. I couldn't help but wince at the sharp stinging from the paper cut gouging his nails left, especially when he started rubbing my shoulder blade with a clammy palm. You see, friend of Bill, he was the first to put it on, Ethan crooned his hushed tone barely audible over Riley's hysteric protests. The rest of us watched him. We watched him flicker and shift, watched him go and then return, coming back with burst ears and screams about hearing God speak. He ran after that thought, didn't you, Riley? Took me ages to track him down and bring him back here. The other two didn't want to, but I was determined. I had to know. I put it on too, you know, friend of Bill. We all did, in the end. We were going to take it to the police, but, well, there's something about it, you know. It's part of something bigger than laws and morality and nations of men. You can't resist it. All three of us caved. The other two, they didn't make it. They ended up like poor Bill. But I was stronger. It shows you things. No, it not just shows. Takes you to them. It took me to so many places. Showed me what I have to do. That we'd find the ends to all this if we wait down here. I have to help him, you see. I have to help him by finding somebody else that God will speak with. I think Riley knew what Ethan was rambling about, because even though he couldn't hear the words, his wails fit the insanity, leaving his captor's lips. Ethan, please, you don't have to do this. It wasn't God. I want to go home. Please let us go home, Ethan. The hysteria had no effect. Ethan carried on as though his other captor didn't exist. The old man knew. He'd put it on, too. Of course he had. He knew we were coming, you see. That's one of the things it showed him. That's why he helped me keep Riley down here. But you don't know what it is, do you, friend of Bill? I must admit, I owe you an apology. That Bill of yours. I just kind of ambushed him without showing him what it was, without explaining just jumped out of the shadows and put it on his face. Kind of rude, no? Ethan let go of my shoulder for the final time. My chest tightened as he walked back around to my field of view. He was holding something, turning it over and over delicately in his grimy hands. It was a mask, a nearly flat, almost featureless mask cast entirely from a single piece of metal. I've never seen any material like it. With the exception of the velvet lining of the interior, the mask was made of porcelain mottled steel. If I had to give it a color, I'd have to say blue, but only just. Reflections of the orange trash can fires circled through hues as they danced. The blue of the steel felt more like an illusion than a color, like it was a trick my mind was pulling to shield me from some spectrum-defying shade. I didn't have long to inspect it. Whether or not that's a good thing, I'm still unsure. I was partway through trying to process the thin circular patterns scratching into the blue steel when Ethan struck. Tell us what it shows you, friend of Bill. Let it take you to God. I had enough time to register the velvet lining sucking at my face. It pulled me inward, latching onto my head, and before I could scream, my every sense was cut to black and silence. I was rising. I couldn't see a thing, but I could feel the pressure of motion all across my back. Some unseen force had me by the navel, yanking me upward with such velocity the air was knocked from my lungs. I wasn't in the museum basement anymore. The sound of Riley's whimpers, Ethan's tittering, the crackle of the trash can fires, all of them had gone. The only sound in my ears was the deafening rush of hurtling through nothingness at God knows how many miles per hour. 
I wanted to scream. I wanted to scream and yell so loud that my ribs snapped. The situation I'd left was PTSD creating levels of horrific. Being held captive by a crazy guy is... Well, it's not normal. But there's nothing about that situation that science can't explain. Hidden Museum exhibits a sight. Having a mask thrust on your face and getting plucked from reality, though. That's a whole different level of messed up, sanity-breaking disturbia. Jesus, I can see how crazy this all sounds. I'm going to need therapy for a long, long time, aren't I? Who am I kidding? No couch and conversation will help me deal with this. This is straitjacket and padded room territory. Hell, if it wasn't for the fact I have proof, I'd be checking into an asylum right now. I just want you to know that. I understand how you're going to react to all this, and just trust me. I know. If this hadn't happened to me, I would be you right now. All doubtful and full of disbelief. Fuck. I wish I could be you right now. Life was better when I didn't believe in stuff like this. No, believe isn't the right word. It's not believing in something if you know that it is real. I can't tell you how long I was ascending in that void. From an outside perspective, I was only gone half a mile or so. And I know that because clocks are a thing, and I checked mine shortly after I'd managed to stop vomiting. That wasn't until later, though. Until after I'd run from that museum so fast, I tore muscles in both legs. From inside where the mask had taken me. From that endless, empty place. The rise through nothingness felt like it went on for years, maybe even decades. It's difficult to tell. What I do know is that there was no warning when I finally stopped. I was still trying to find air to scream with when something crashed into my back. The pain was immediate, like I'd been thrown into a brick wall by a steroid-addicted pro wrestler. The sound of my own coughing was the first sensory stimulation I registered. Next, I noted that I wasn't cold anymore. The subterranean storage room had been chilly, and the void I'd flown through was freezing to the point my lack of frostbite is still a little disconcerting. This place, though, this place was warm. The air had the steady, artificial heat of an advanced temperature control system. For context, the museum Bill and I purchased was kept warm during these short, mild winters by a few outlet-powered electric radiators. Despite being blind, I knew I wasn't in the storage room anymore. Yeah, that's right. I couldn't see. My eyes had been deprived of light for so long that it took a few minutes for vision to return. It wasn't until I'd tried to blink a few times that I realized they weren't closed. That was far from my only problem, though. Shortly after the wind's knocking slam, there was an unpleasant lurching sensation in my stomach, almost like I was in a barrel being rolled over a cliff edge in slow motion. It didn't take me long to figure out what the unusual nausea was. It was gravity returning. Wherever I was, I was laying on my back. A few more blinks later, I had enough vision to piece together that I was indoors again. It wasn't the museum basement anymore, though. I had no idea where I was, but it wasn't somewhere I'd been before. This new place was brightly lit by rows of long bulbs screwed into cages hanging above. The ceiling and walls were completely painted a dull, depressing gray, save for waist-high tiling that also covered the floor. The tiles must have been white once, once being the optimum word there. By the time I dropped on them, they were a browning yellow, the unique tone of years of janitorial neglect. There was no time to dwell on filthy tiles, however. I wasn't alone. When I pulled myself up, it only took one frantic whip around of my head to see this place was a long corridor. Despite the filth, I could smell a variety of industrial-strength cleaning chemicals. While the eyes said abandoned abattoir, the nose said wartime field hospital. The white coats worn by the four or five perplexed men and women surrounding me fueled this suspicion. Whoa. 
or what the actual hell? One of them sat, an Indian man with a name badge that outlined him as Dr. Anad. What the actual goddamn hell? See? This is what happens when you redirect 90% of the security research budget into chasing a madwoman with a book and a grudge. Where did you come from? How did you spontaneously manifest in here? Who are you? I held my hands up, pulse once again racing, when I saw the slick black handles of the pistols each of them carried in hip holsters. I'm Benjamin. Benjamin Croker. Please, I... I never got to finish my sentence, not because of the pistols, or because of the group of doctors who looked just as confused and alarmed by my presence here as I was. It was because of the howl. It came from down the corridor, from around the corner barely fifteen feet behind a man whose badge informed me was named Dr. Harper Girard. How bloody hell, he said speaking with a thick British accent as he spun 180 degrees and drew his pistol. Bloody hell, it's happening. They're here. I didn't have to guess who they were. The howls grew louder with every split second that passed, reaching their crescendo before Dr. Anad had time to bark his response. Robert, find Leona and get to the vessel. But now, Robert, I don't care what year it is. If they get to the hangar, you make the jump. The color drained from Dr. Harper Girard's face. He spun past me, shooting another confused look my way as he went. I didn't care. I'll be honest, I wasn't paying him much attention. Dr. Anand and the other science types weren't paying me much attention anymore, either. We were all focused on the tide of shrieking, roaring monstrosities, barreling around the corner and rolling as a foul tide towards us. I could smell them before I saw them. A reeking stench that cut above even the tangy miasma of industrial chemicals. I'd never smelled anything like it, like a mixture of bread mold and gasoline. The things moved fast, though. I'd barely even started being repulsed by noxious fumes in my nostrils when I stopped to start screaming at the sight of their source. I couldn't count how many there were. It could have been anywhere between dozens and hundreds, a seething mass of slick, glistening bodies. A pressurized onslaught of slug-fleshed beings twice the size of any man. I only knew the tsunami of mucus-coated gray abominations wasn't a single creature because of all the mouths. They'd risen from the phlegmy surface as the things writhed and slithered over each other, vanishing again as the next howl began pushing the maw back beneath the slimy waves. Their teeth struck me the most, more angular than any I'd seen even on statues. Perfect squares, the kind of teeth cartoon characters have. Charming in animation, sure, but to see them in real life. Haunting, harrowing, terrifying. Pick your adjective. Any work. So straight were the angles of those teeth, and the sight of so many ignited the flare of a migraine at my temples. I'm trying not to picture them as I write this, but... Jesus. Double Jesus. Behemoth slug monstrosities are bad enough in their own right. A sight of gnashers that defy natural design so much they create headaches feels like overkill. God damn, Bill. Why'd you have to fall for the charm of anchors and dried starfish? We could have picked up that nice lodge in Wisconsin, but no. You had to cave in to my need for ocean air. I'm so sorry. I felt another hand tugging on my shoulder. This grip was strong as Ethan's, although thankfully it didn't come with skin-piercing dirty fingernails. I don't know who you are, but you've got to move. I turned, following the arm to gaze into a pair of wide green eyes. They were on a young face, and the name badge on this lab coat revealed that face to belong to one assistant researcher, Fisher. Come on, she repeated, yanking my shoulder again. Move. I couldn't move. I couldn't do anything except blubber shrill nonsense, knees weak and breaths rapid as they were shallow. Fisher pulled again, and I fell into her, knocking us both to the ground. Fisher, leave him. I looked up to see Dr. Anad. He'd drawn his pistol and was firing round after round into the oncoming grin-covered biomass. But why'd he show up now? It has to mean something. 
Dr. Anad screamed down at her over the gunfire, his furious gaze never leaving the tsunami of shrieking gunk. Fisher, leave him. God damn it. That's an order. The salvo of pistol fire was ineffective. Fisher was still struggling to get out from under me when the slathering tide reached the first of the lab coats. I didn't catch the name on their badge, the one that got pulled into the gaping square-toothed orifice. I heard them scream, though. We all did, even over the deafening choral howling of the countless Cheshire Catman slugs. The unfortunate first victim had stood barely four feet from where Fisher and I lay. One of the pulsating things had whipped itself mouth first from the mass. The angular teeth dug through the lab coats and flesh beneath like it was half-set jelly. Before any one of us caught on to what had just happened, the jaws around his torso snapped back into the throng, taking the bloodied lab coat-wearing mess with them. The man barely had time to scream. Within less than a second, the seething tide had consumed him. The rolling, twisting mouths fighting each other to claim the largest chunks of meat. This is when I started screaming again. It was a different scream than any I'd made so far last night or on any other. There's not a word for the emotion in that scream. It was a primordial panic, long hidden in our DNA. A cocktail of hormones unused since long before we came down from the trees. Assistant researcher Fisher was yelling, although I think this was because she couldn't push me off of her. Get up! Get up, you idiots! Or we're going to... Then she started screaming, too. I was aware of the smell before anything else. This close, it was so powerful, my diaphragm instantly began to convulse. I turned round to see what Fisher had been screaming at, although despite my undulated panic, I knew what I'd seen above me. At full height, it was easily ten feet tall. One of the beings had reached us, but instead of pulling us into the throng, it had decided it wanted us to itself. It had stood upright, launching itself ahead of the encroaching horde and directing to full size with one disgusting movement. Up close, the teeth were even worse. Each was the size of my face, and the unblemished white of their surface was so bright, I'm genuinely amazed they weren't illuminated. I knew where the smell came from now, too. It was their breath. The nauseating stench magnified a thousandfold as the beast opened its garbage chute wide maw. It bent over until its teeth were inches from our screaming faces. Then it howled, the sound cutting through every nerve ending in me. My bones rattled, sinew and tendons tense to the point of nearly snapping. The hot, mold-scented breath billowed over us. Spewing from the roaring abomination with such force, the air was once more knocked from my lungs. I couldn't help but close my eyes. Fisher stopped struggling. I could feel her grip on me tighten, her fear now overpowering her as much as mine was me. There was no getting away. Those maddening teeth were too close. I screwed my face as tight as I could and wailed. Do you know what having monstrous jaws cut through your flesh like freshly baked cake feels like? Me neither. I'd been expecting to find out, but I never did. Neither did assistant researcher Fisher. One moment, all I could hear was the abyssal howls of the grey tide and the blam blam of the pistol fire. The next, there was nothing, save for whimpers, yells, and the babbling of my own continued panic. Instead of hot pain as alabaster enamel carves my intestines, all I felt was the rush of unexplained wind on my back. I was once again ascending the void. I wasn't alone this time, though. Fisher was still beneath me. Unlike me, she wasn't screaming. I think she was too scared and confused to scream. Like Ethan, her nails began to dig into my back, but unlike with him, it wasn't intentional. She was glaring up at me, holding tight as she could, mouth flapping open and closed as her brain failed to make sense of what was happening. Again, there was no warning when our seconds or years-long journey up through the void ended. It happened exactly the same. The unpleasant crashing, the nauseating flip-flop of gravity in my guts, the rapid blinking to return vision to blinded eyes. Wherever I was this time was outdoors. 
I knew that because I could feel the stinging whip of cold night air even before I'd blinked the moon and stars into focus. How'd they find us? How'd they find us? How'd they find us? I became aware of a woman's voice next to me, repeating a shell-shocked mantra over and over. It only took a few seconds for my memory to catch up. You're here. She turned to me and blinked a couple of times before responding. I I'm here. What does that mean? I'm here. Don't you think you should explain why you're here first? And where here is? It was my turn to need a few seconds to cognitively process this nonsensical exchange. Do you even know about the mask? I eventually hazarded. Mask? What? What are you talking about? Uh, no. Fisher stammered, the color still not returning to her cheeks. Mask, this guy tells me. Honestly, I... Look, fuck your mask. What were you doing in the London facility? How did you... Wait. London facility? Did you say London? Yes, London. Where did you think? California. Once more, the lab coach woman looked. California? Yes, California. One minute Bill and I were moving old museum stuff, and the next... You've teleported me from London to California. W what? No. Before I could react, Fisher was up on her feet. Her sleek black pistol was drawn and bearing down on me. I gulped, but it wasn't like I was calm beforehand. By this point, having a gun pointed at me was a drop in the ocean when it came to reasons to panic. Please, just wait a minute. I think there's been some kind of... No, no, you wait a minute. I want answers now. Were you even there for me? No, of course you weren't. Dr. Anand. No, no, you were... You were there for him, weren't you? For Robert. Yes, to make sure the director couldn't reset the... She let out a sudden gasp, clapping a hand to her mouth, and nearly dropped her pistol. You're with her, aren't you? She told them where to find us. That bitch. When they finally find her, I'm going to... You're going to what, Samantha? Fisher and I both froze. Fisher somehow lost even more color in her cheeks. Her bottom lip started to tremble. This new voice also belongs to a woman. And at first, I was confused as to why Fisher responded to it with such... Well, with such fear. It was the same way she'd responded to the tide of mucus-coated abominations. I couldn't see any reason for her panic. The voice was soothing, if anything. Calm and level. A rich, female voice that drummed up mental images of freshly baked pies, drawings on fridges, and stories before bed. A mother's voice, if that makes any sense. I'm not sure it does, because I'm reading this back, and I don't think it conveys what I'm trying to convey at all. But it'll have to do. Fisher, though. The way Fisher reacted, you'd think she'd heard the voice of Hitler. She'd even dropped her pistol. I didn't wait around when I saw it thud on the soil. The dirt had barely settled when I was back on my feet, heart racing, brain working overtime to make sense of both my new surroundings and the woman Fisher was backing slowly away from. All I could see for miles were fields of rotting vegetables. I knew they were rotting because the air had that faint sweetness to it, the same kind you get by the trash behind vegan restaurants. The woman had approached us from behind where Fisher stood, meaning the latter woman went from aiming a gun at me to trying to cower behind me and use me as a shield to protect her from... Well, I was about to find out what from. The former woman, the one Fisher was as afraid of as slug things from my nightmares, was striking to look at. Again, I'm going to have to make some attempts with language here. Beautiful isn't the word. She definitely wasn't what you'd call sexy, hot, foxy, or any of those wants to put penis in terms that straight men use. It's not to say they wouldn't want to. Far from it. The lust appeal wasn't what made her features captivating, though. She was, well, perfect. That's the closest word I have. What I can't tell you is exactly what quality it was she'd perfected, 
uh, some kind of combination of grace, uh, beauty, innocence, wisdom, danger, and hope that no human language has words for. Juxtaposed to the auburn hair and unknowable perfect qualities of her head was the body beneath it. In terms of shape, it wasn't anything to write home about. Nothing that would get heads turning. Well, apart from the arm, that is. Her left one was missing. In its place was a robotic appendage, the most advanced prosthetic limb I'd ever seen. It was sleek, almost liquid in how it moved. I felt my stomach drop when I saw the metal surface of its arm. The mottled, almost blue, pearlescent plates forged from a strange metal I was far too familiar with. What wasn't so sleek were the scars and burns where cutting-edge mechanisms met her living flesh. Even though she was lit only by the pallid moonlight, I could see the pain in that gnarled scarring, the agony that must have been endured to produce marks so red and raw-looking. Geraldine? It was Fisher's turn to stammer. What? What are you? Geraldine. The woman mocked Fisher's fear, putting on a whiny mock child voice. Please, pull yourself together, Samantha. Oh, and it's Dr. Easley to you. I didn't get my PhD for nothing. My gaze played tennis between the two. The trembling girl in a lab coat cowering behind me, and the cyborg paragon of womanhood in her tracksuit bottoms and tank top still approaching her. Now, Sammy, I think the real question is... What are you doing here? And who is he? I could feel the confusion in Fisher's response. What? What do you mean, who is he? He's one of yours. You sent him. Eastley shook her head. No, he doesn't work for me. I haven't needed anyone to work with me in, oh, what is it, five years now. What in God's name are you talking about? We found the mole who'd been leaking the database to you last week. Last week? Dr. Easley raised an eyebrow. But... Boxstead died. Wait. What year do you think it is? Don't play games with me, Geraldine. I know you're the one who told the form takers that Bramfield's being kept at the London... Fisher never got to finish her sentence. The moment she mentioned the word Bramfield, Dr. Easley burst out into fits of unrestrained laughter. Bramfield, London facility. (laughs) Well, that explains it then. So what happened? Did you sneak into the Harbour Garage chamber? Finally got curious about how your esteemed director would... Oh... Dr. Easley's gaze shifted from Fisher to myself. Oh, well isn't this too priceless? So tell me, which version of the mask did you put on? I know it's not the one that they have, the one he keeps fusing to that poor clone of himself for special occasions. Was it the one in Russia, then? The one under the Eiffel Tower? Or perhaps California? California? It was in California. I swallowed, my mouth dry. With every word she spoke, Dr. Easley's voice felt less and less comforting. Ah, yes, the one in the Pembroke collection. Thought so. How young was Ethan, wasn't you? Pembroke collection? Fisher piped up from behind me, suddenly finding some courage. What are you talking about? I was on the team that recovered the Pembroke collection. There wasn't a... Easley laughed again. (laughs) On the team. Good one, Samantha. Bringing the field researchers their coffee hardly counts. Were you even allowed to enter the premises? Silence from behind my shoulder. Thought not. Well, this bewildered fellow here is a little out of time. Aren't you, my friend? I mean... You both are, but this poor sod is further from where he should be. I'm guessing he thinks it's... What? 2021? I nodded. Oh, bless you. See, Fisher, he's not one of mine. 
He's just some unlucky fool that found the Pembroke Collection before you guys cordoned it off and demolished the place. What are you talking about, Eastley? Fisher was yelling now. How can he? The Pembroke building was destroyed three years ago. It's... I never saw the arm move. Neither did Fisher, which is why I think she didn't get out of the way. One moment, Dr. Eastley stood, one eyebrow cocked, hands on her hips. Next, she was on the tip of her feet, face looking in a snarl, her human hand balled into a fist. Her artificial one wasn't really a hand anymore. The blue steel limb had whipped forward, extending and wrapping itself thrice around Fisher so fast that she was dangling in the air before I'd even realized Eastley's arm wasn't an arm anymore. Don't you get it, Samantha? There's no London facility. There's not even an upset anymore. It was destroyed, demolished on the same night you hitchhiked a ride with this guy. Eastley nodded in my direction, but her wild eyes never left the screaming fisher suspended about ten feet above us. You get it now? I won. By the time that night ended, I'd invented the all-parent. Jesus, seems so long ago now. I've had to be so patient, you know. They're here now, though. Tonight is the night the universe ends. Forever. No restarts and anyone that could have hoped to stop it died years ago. I wiped them all off the map, even Bramfield. I'd always assumed the form takers got you. They were nothing to do with me, FYI. Them figuring out where Bramfield was and decided to act on it that same night was just a happy fluke. Quite convenient, actually. Having them all in the same place made wiping them out en masse so much easier. Have you ever killed a god? Trust me, it's a rush. Dr. Eastley was smirking now. There was zero comfort in her words by this point. Truth be told, I was starting to feel like an idiot for even having questioned Fisher's fear of her. In case you're wondering, I still have no fucking clue what any of the stuff they were back and forthing over meant. All that time, all that went through my head was the mantra... Please wake up, on loop. I wish I'd been more with it. Something tells me if I had been, I could have got some answers out of that Dr. Eastley. Despite the fact she grew more terrifying with every passing second, she was the only person who seemed to have the faintest clue what was happening to me. Fisher knew a little more than me, although apparently not much. Besides, even if I did have the wherewithal to question Fisher, she wouldn't have been able to tell me much without a hat. Fisher's screams will be with me until the day I die. This whole messed up experience will be, no doubt, but her death wails will take up a special rent-free space in my head, I'm sure. As the coils of pearlescent almost blue tightened around her as she howled at a pitch hitherto unreached by any human-born sound I've ever heard. The volume was near deafening, almost as loud as the shrieking sea of phlegm-coated abominations had been. Almost loud enough to mask the dull snappings of her bones crackling under the pressure of the steel. Sadly, only almost, though. Fisher was still conscious of an alarming number of those thick, organic crunches. Her jaw was still flapping when the pressure popped her eyes from their sockets. Legs still kicked, even as her steaming, dripping innards were squeezed from both ends like a stamped-on tube of toothpaste. The screams only stopped when Fisher's skull, unable to fight the tendrils coiling around it any longer, imploded. I'm sorry you had to see that. Truly, I am. Easley's smirk made the sincerity of her words difficult to believe. I don't want any loose ends, though, you know. Speaking of, it's probably in my interest to get rid of you, too. Please, don't. Please, I don't know what's happening. I really don't. I just want this to end. Wait, no, not like this. I just want to go home. I just want to... 
I stopped begging for my life when I realized the boa constrictor appendage wasn't snaking around to squeeze the last breaths from my body. Dr. Easley was still smirking, but the traces of venomous snarl had vanished. I was far from calmed by this, but it did at least let me know that the fate she had in store for me was different from that of Fisher. Kill you? Oh, my dear, no. No, no, no. What will be the point? That's why I'm doing this, you see. So you and Fisher and all the rest of them never have to die again. This is the last time. That's why I brought you here, I think, to show you. It's mischievous like that. They doesn't want me to succeed, you see. They, none of them do. They enjoy preying on you. Preying on us far too much. They don't want the ride to stop. I gulped, but said nothing. What was I supposed to say? I had no idea what in fuck's name she was talking about. All I could think was how much I didn't want to end up like Fisher. How much I wanted to wake up next to Bill in our normal bed in my own life. For this to have been some twisted, uncharacteristically vivid, imaginative nightmare. No such luck. Eastley continued her spiel, head angled, gazing at me as a chef does the lobster they're yet to decide how to cook. Well, I hope you know that its plan won't work. Duff couldn't stop me. Talem couldn't stop me. The man in charge couldn't stop me. Hell, even Bramfield couldn't stop me. What chance do you have? Something happened when she said the word you. It was brief, so fast that I almost didn't notice. A weight, a momentary heaviness, accompanied by the fleeting sensation of warm velvet. Disrupt the timeline as much as you want, you devious little object. I've known all about you and your little games from the beginning. You won't survive this time. This is the end. Permanent. It's done. You lost, you and all the rest of the parasites and predators that fed on us over and over for eternity. Game over. The charade ends tonight. In fact, if you'll both do me a favor and look up. Now, this next part you'll have to bear with me on. A lot happens that I'm not sure I have the language to explain. Again, I felt the weight on my face, the softness of velvet. It wasn't brief this time, though. It lingered, pulling my head until I was staring at the night sky above. I'm getting tired of telling you that I screamed, but... Well, what do you want me to do? I did. I screamed so hard that hot stabs of pain shot through my jaw and throat from tearing vocal cords. The stars above had gone. At an insurmountable speed, they vanished one by one. Within a second or two, I was staring not at a starry sky, but at vast, empty darkness that stretched quite literally until the ends of the universe. Then, the humming started. It wasn't a sound, you understand. It was a feeling. A physical vibration rattling every cell in my body individually, like they were sought out and each inflicted with their own personal earthquake. I was shaking, but I wasn't being shaken. The ground wasn't trembling. There was no shifting and grinding of tectonic plates beneath my feet. This shaking came from within, as though my body was being urged by some inexplicable force to tear itself apart at an atomic level. It didn't take long for the pain to become unbearable. I couldn't help if I was screaming anymore. I couldn't hear anything except for a deep, low, deafening white noise that seemed to be coming from everywhere at once. That's when the eyes started opening. There were millions of them. They revealed themselves almost in unison, emerging in the pitch darkness where the stars once shone distressingly human-looking eyes of all sizes, an uncountable number of gazes staring down at Earth, the last morsel left of a universe-sized feast. Suddenly, I was reminded of Ethan, of his rambling about Riley and what Riley had wailed as he begged for his friends to understand. It's not God. 
If Riley had described anything remotely like what I witnessed, then it's understandable why Ethan jumped to divine conclusions. The weight on my face grew heavier with each passing moment. The sensation of the hitherto absent mask became ever more real in the presence of... of whatever it was bearing down on our infinitely tiny planet. Somehow I knew that those eyes belonged to one being... This was the... the all-parents that Eastley had been raving about. It had to be. Why else would the invisible weights of my face be trembling? I think the mask pulled us out of there just in time. The seething thrum from my cells had evolved into an all-body burning. I was actually grateful to feel the cold rush of the void. The soothing chill of nothingness rushed past me for minutes, decades on end. The more distance I put between myself and that glaring, hateful horizon, the better. In the few seconds before my vision cut to shifting blackness, the ground beneath me had started splitting. I guess is the word. There weren't chasms forming in the soil. That's not what I'm trying to say. It's like every grain of dirt on Earth lost its connection to gravity simultaneously. Rocks turned to sand in a heartbeat. Distant mountains collapsed into liquid as though they'd been faking solid status this whole time and just had their surface tension broken. The low, rumbling sound had reached a crescendo that gave Riley's deafness a sudden, harrowing context. I think if the mask wasn't so afraid, I'd have suffered the same fate. Thankfully, I seemed to have gotten away with a real bad case of tinnitus. The last thing I remember of my time in the rotting vegetables was, despite the pain, trying to comprehend the being above me. The sheer scale of it. It gives me a brain freeze trying to think about it now, for lack of a better term. A being larger than the universe, a living thing so vast that enveloped the entirety of visible space in a matter of seconds. It was all I could think about as I rose through the void for the penultimate time. Whatever this, this all-parent was, it couldn't possibly exist. Even though I'd seen it with my own eyes, felt it gazing down at me personally with its infinite, trillion-eyed gaze, my mind refused to accept it. Remember when I said I was writing this partially to make sense of it for myself? Yeah. Ninety percent of this effort is trying to wrap my head around the fact something like... like that could be real. I couldn't imagine it, you see. Never could I have conceived of something that colossal, that hopelessly vast. Even writing about it now, it makes me feel a little queasy. As I said, this is my second-to-last trip through the void. The mask had one last place to take me. One last stop in its last-ditch attempts to if Eastley was to be believed, prevents whatever I'd just witnessed from becoming true. I think that's what she meant, at least. Even though her words felt like the most important I'd ever heard, I could barely keep up with what she was saying. I was hoping that by the time I wrote it all down, I'd understand it a bit better. No joy. I'd never been a big ideas guy. Doing an overnight crash course in going mad hasn't changed that, it seems. I didn't know I only had one more step at the time. I was just glad that wherever I'd end up next couldn't be as sanity undoing as the possible universal apocalypse I'd just left. Wherever I was about to go, I told myself, nothing could be as bad as that. It will probably surprise none of you to know that this assumption was laughably wrong. This time... The pressing void didn't fade, no matter how much I blinked. It lingered long after the impact pain subsided, when the flip-flop of yet again readjusting to gravity had been and gone. It wasn't until I looked either side of me that I could breathe a sigh of relief. The blindness wasn't permanent, thank God. I knew this because I could see clearly wherever else I looked. It was only above me that my vision couldn't penetrate and by the time I'd got to my feet for a better understanding of my surroundings, I'd found this wasn't because of problems with my sight. Darkness hung above this new place, a thick cloud of gaseous, inky nothingness that no light could disturb. 
The same blackness had been falling through for hours and or centuries. It was rolling above me in all directions as far as I could see, covering every horizon in a blanket of non-light deeper than even the starlessness that preceded those goddamn eyes. The darkness was uniform and unbroken. Somehow I knew it wasn't still, though. Although please don't ask me to elaborate on this. It was moving, writhing, alive and I was aware of this despite having literally zero reasons to be. My face was wet with tears, and by that time my feet were moving. I was too broken to argue with them by then. I'd seen far too much already. Had my mind torn and restitched only to go through it all over again a moment later. Nothing, though, not even possibly witnessing the end of the universe, could have toughened my physique enough. For this, I wasn't on Earth anymore. Notice how I didn't tell you what I could hear, what I could smell, the temperature of the air. That's because there was nothing to report. The void the mask kept yanking me up through was freezing, as I've mentioned several times already. The moment I landed, that chill left, which was, as always, a relief. It wasn't replaced by warmth, though. It wasn't replaced by anything. I wasn't numb, per se. I could definitely feel still. The aching from my back after a third fling through endless nothingness was testament enough for that. It's more like the nerve endings responsible for reporting air temperature had been silenced. The tears on my face were still warm and wet. The vague awareness of weight and velvet on my face hadn't gone. Only the air was a mystery, if there was even any at all. I can't stress this enough. Please don't ask me to try and expand on that. I genuinely don't think my mind could take it. Hell, I'm starting to doubt it can take what little I've already put together. Maybe I should stop writing this. No. No, if I don't do this now, then I never will. I need to get this out while I'm still coherent, especially if this all means what I think it does. I owe Bill that much. The faint, velvet tugging pulled me through this unknowable place for what must have been weeks. I know it must have been weeks because I shaved yesterday morning, and now I have a beard down to my collarbone. I've given up trying to work out how time worked in the void, so I'm sure as hell not going to bother trying to figure out why I aged in that library, but didn't die of starvation. Oh yeah, that's where I was, you see. The landscape the mask marched me through was an endless plain of towering, rickety, wooden bookshelves. A goddamned library waiting at the bottom of an infinite void. Or maybe it was the top. It's difficult to tell. My idea of up or down has been pulled to pieces almost as much as my sense of time. There was no sun that I could see, no vast bulbs or burning pyres to explain the total and unbroken illumination of this flat realm of books and silence. Every inch of it was visible, as though directly under a spotlight. I had no trouble at all reading the titles on the spines of some of the volumes while a mask pulled me onward. I'm not going to tell you all the ones I remember, because some of them... Well, fuck. I don't want to believe they could even exist. A whole section of Four Dummies books detailing how to do every unspeakable thing you could conceive of. Rows of what appeared to be photo albums, each labeled with the name of some atrocity from human history. The majority of which occurring long before the invention of cameras. There were miles and miles of autobiographies by figures I knew for a fact never wrote one. People like Heinrich Himmler, Jeffrey Epstein, Emperor Nero, Charles Manson, and Idi Amin, to name a few. There were many names amongst the infamous that I didn't recognize, and never once to if the titles of their life stories are any indication. Whoever H. Yardley is, or was, anyone associated with a book called Eating My Son, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love My Truth, isn't somebody I want to learn about. And that's just the example I can bring myself to share. 
There was no uniformity to the shelves themselves beyond them all being wooden. The tallest of them was around ten to twelve feet, the shortest one just reaching my ankle. Rows were a bit of a generous way to describe their arrangements, too. There were passages and corridors through the maze of wood and pages, sure, but none felt deliberate. This wasn't planned like a regular library. None of the spaces between shelves we ventured down were straight, spacious, or even seemed intentional. Once or twice I could have sworn new pathways opened up in front of us, like some of the bookcases moved aside to grant us entry when they thought I wasn't looking. Not only did I feel tempted to pick up and read any of those books, it wasn't anything to do with their titles, either. Read? Are you kidding? I couldn't even think straight. I was a shell by that point. An empty, blubbering vessel being led through an impossible place by an invisible, malicious object I could only half feel. Of course, I tried taking it off. I'm not a dumbass. That was the first thing I tried when I realized the weight of it wasn't going away this time. Why do you think I was so dejected, so morose and hopeless, as it led me through the endless shelves for all those weeks? There was nothing I could do, except wait to die. Alone, in a library that was either at the end of known creation, or something outside it entirely. You again? I thought I told you to bugger off. I can't remember what exactly I was despairing about at the moment I heard the voice. It could have been my fading memories of Bill. It could have been the glowing realization that I hadn't starved to death yet and might be walking this maze of books forever. Who knows? What I do know is that when I heard it, I damn near had a heart attack. It had been weeks since I'd last spoken to anyone, and that person had been Dr. Eastley. Suffice to say, I wasn't exactly expecting conversation. I especially wasn't expecting conversation to start from behind me, from the passage I'd just trudged down, the one I knew for a fact was empty. I whirled around, lungs getting ready to scream again for the first time in God knows how long. They didn't, though. I was too surprised to scream. Not shocked, not terrified, no more so than I already was, at least. Just surprised. Standing between two bookshelves containing large dictionaries of languages I didn't recognize was an old woman. Not a witchy, hag-like old woman, and not the kind of woman you got in fairy tales, the ones that were all bones and edges and malice. If I had to choose a word to describe the tiny, wrinkled deer in front of me, I would have said homely. Her face was as round as her ample waistline, her eyes were sunken, but still glinted with memories of mischief long ago. Well, they would have done if the toothless mouth under her creased, bulbous nose wasn't locked in a scowl. Oi, I said I thought I told you to bug her off. Go on, get lost. She dropped the stack of books she'd been carrying and raised her arms, brushing at the air with her wrists as she walked towards me, shooing me away to... Well, who the hell knows where? It was when the invisible velveteen weights on my face grew heavier that I realized she wasn't talking to me. The invisible mask juddered, rattling my teeth. That look Eastley had, the one where she was almost looking through me, was in the eyes of this new, much older woman. The wrinkled deer cocked an ear like she was listening to words outside the scope of my woefully inadequate human hearing. There was a long, oppressively silent pause. Through it, the pressure on my face bucked and shook. The old woman would tut occasionally, sometimes saying things like a likely story and pull the other one. Eventually, she held up her palms and shook her head. Look, look, I don't want to hear it, she said. You know how it is the same as I do. It ends and begins again. I'm not having you pissing about around here for however many billions of years while you wait for them to come down from the trees again. The master was very clear last time when you... More buckling and kicking on my face, this time so violently that I actually let out a little yelp. The old woman rolled her eyes at this, but the invisible commotion didn't stop until her expression started to change from annoyance to concern. 
That can't be right, she eventually said. They made it, but they're not supposed to end it. What did you say that woman's name was? Eastley? Another round of painful thumping on my head. Okay, okay, calm down. Don't blame me for asking questions. I've never heard of a Geraldine Eastley. Not that one, at least. The largest thump yet, so hard that a trickle of blood gushed from my nose. I raised my shirt to stem the blood. The dissonance when my hands didn't touch the steel and velvets my face felt caused instant nausea. But I managed to contain myself. It's not like I had anything in me to spew. Look, of course it matters that I haven't heard of her. The woman continued, ignoring both me and the scarlet leaking from my nose. I've heard of everyone. If I haven't heard of them, they don't exist. If they don't exist, then we've got a big bloody problem. She turned, beckoning over her shoulder for me, for us, to follow. I could hear her muttering to herself as she stomped through the void, sealing the labyrinth wilderness of spines, covers, and shelves. The Master's not going to like this. Yet another bleeding mess they're going to have to sort out. You know they're going to be pissed. Why can't any of you lot play your bloody parts? An infinitely reoccurring universe full of endless reincarnated life, and still you find ways to bugger it up. That thing wouldn't even care if you idiots inside were making such a bloody ruckus every cycle. Bloody ha, throwing a bloody tantrum, and now I'm going to be the one that gets it in the buggering neck. On and on she ranted. I wish I understood any of what she was saying. Sanity be damned. Sometimes you can hear things that you don't really comprehend, but you know are important. Rapid fire T's and C's at the end of ads are a good example, right? Well, this old woman's borderline nonsensical mutterings felt like the T's and C's of life itself. Like I was listening to somebody laying out the fundamental rules underpinning all of known existence, but in a way that my monkey brain couldn't grasp enough to make sense of. One of my biggest challenges recovering from this will be letting go of my memories of her British curse-filled ranting. If I don't, I'll tear myself apart trying to make sense of it. I know the answer to, well, to everything is in there but I also know I'll destroy myself trying to find it long before I even come close. I was relieved that we weren't walking for long. I'd trekked through that library more than enough. I was beyond sick of it. I didn't know we were approaching the final destination of my journey, of course. I was just eager for something to happen. Anything to break the insanity of marching through those endless bookcases alone. The old woman was still mid-rant when she showed us around a corner into... that place. Of everything I witnessed since finding the trapdoor, the room waiting for us beyond the final bookshelf was the most language-defying of all. My screams were both instantaneous and made all the more violent by the fact I couldn't hear them. The old woman had taken us to a small space that wasn't small at all. Physically, it was small, but in the other dimensions, the ones that a simple human being like me wasn't supposed to be able to perceive, it was huge. It was also full. What of, I couldn't tell you. Not because I'm not allowed to, or because I don't want to, but because I literally can't. I don't know what the things rolling and sliding over and through each other beyond where the physical space ended were. I don't know what words I'd use to describe them, either. They had qualities to them, sure, but none of these qualities were familiar. There was nothing I could define as color or shape or substance. I was aware of their angles, their lines, their curves, but I couldn't see them. I knew they were talking, discussing, communicating, but I couldn't hear them. I was registering them with senses I didn't know I had. No. Senses I know I didn't have, and never have done outside that reasonless place. There was no floor beneath us, but I walked on solid ground. Only one of the room's occupants was inside the physical boundaries, the walls that occupy the dimensions you and I understand. It was to this figure, somehow miles away yet reached in a few steps, that the old woman spoke after she cleared her throat. Sorry to disturb you, Master. A version of the Fitanex mask is back again. 
at the most current one. I told it to bugger off, Master, of course, but it's, well, it's here about a hundred years earlier than expected, and, um, it is a problem, Master. The things didn't end like they should this time. The invisible weight was trembling again. I could feel the mask's fear, a noxious wave of unchecked panic that washed over me from the head down. My knees weakened. A few seconds of tingling at my fingers and toes preceded a total numbness of the extremities. I was sobbing again, but it wasn't a stream of steady tears anymore. It was uncontrollably, unrestrainedly, unashamedly, in ways that only newborn babies are capable of. Could I hear it, though? No. The only sounds were the machine gun badump of my heartbeat in my ears. A splitting migraine blooming from behind my eyes in a matter of seconds. The weeks of sleepless, endless walking, catching up and mixing with the nauseating pseudo-sensory overstimulation. All ties to life before the mask left me. Hell, to life before the library, even. I passed out and awoke, and passed out again, over and over in quick succession, never being unconscious long enough for my head to droop more than an inch or two. My brain forgot how to correct my vision, flipping everything 180 degrees. The beating in my ears fused into a crescendo of white noise. With no voice, I opened my mouth and begged the tiny infinites around me for death. And all of this before the thing had even turned around. From right next to me, and miles away, I could hear the old woman mumbling her feeble excuses. I am truly sorry to disturb you, Master, especially with something as trivial as creation. Like I said, this version of the Fittinix mask, well, I'm sure I don't need to remind your eminent self that this cycle is... It was uh, due to end when Girthrix became powerful enough to penetrate the barrier, about a century from this mask's present form, what I gather, as it always is when the cycle decides to end that way. The thing in front of us bore down on her. I almost don't want to describe it to you. If I do, you might make the mistake of feeling prepared, and then if you were ever unfortunate enough to meet it, You'd break under the weight of your cosmetically hopeless naivety. I could see it, but the fraction of it I could see was far from the whole. The rest of it I can't translate into words, because, much like its... its layer, I guess, I wasn't perceiving it with any senses that human beings were built to experience. Despite being no taller than around seven feet in our three familiar dimensions, in those I wish I didn't know about, it was vaster even than the eyes that swallowed the universe. Much vaster. The thing's appearance, which, as I said, mattered little, was itself far from normal. Like much of what I witnessed about opening the trap door, it was therapy-inducing in its own right. The figure was humanoid, androgynous, gangly, and dressed in a crinkled gray suit with polished black dress shoes, complete with a skinny, equally black tie and pressed white collar shirt, the same shade of white as a dying star. The centerpiece was the face, though. Or rather, the ear. That's all there was at the end of its long neck, you see. A massive human ear, about three feet long. An ear that was looking at us. But, well, uh, the thing is, Master, it's here. They found a way to sneak a bit of themselves in. The bloody ending it, Master. As in ending, ending it. Like I said, I would never normally disturb you about anything as insignificant as creation, but, well, without the recurrent cycle, things could get messy, Master. That's the last thing I remember of the conversation that followed. The mask, the old woman, and the ear discussed subjects beyond my comprehension, but it didn't matter. Even if I could have understood, I still wouldn't have been able to listen. Both my body and mind had reached the limits of their endurance. The head-splitting, whatever it was, started when we entered the cramped but open space, finally pushed me beyond cognitive reasoning. 
My only memories are a flash of, well, not even images, not sounds or sights or anything like that. When I cast my mind back, all I get is a rolling tide of sensation, of concepts and ideas and emotions I can't define, but that's it. I remember the ear. That sticks through. I remember the rage, too. But more than anything, I remember the rage. If you're like me, and you're a bit of a, well, a shit-stirrer, you know what it feels like when somebody is so angry with you they're imagining ways to kill you. Like when they've actively visualized it in their head, and that little vein starts popping on their neck or temple. You know the kind of fury I'm talking about. The kind you can basically feel. That was the rage that oozed from the ear thing. Except, instead of coming from one person, imagine it coming from an entire football stadium of them. Every single one glaring down at you, alone in the center of the field. A pure, concentrated hatred. Hate I didn't know it was possible for anything to feel, let alone be. No. I think the less we dwell on that, the better. As I said, I was experiencing things with sensations I don't fully understand. I think... I think I was that hated at one point. Not like I was the subject of it, or that I experienced feeling it. I was being it. Living as it, while it brewed within the ear thing. Yeah, you know what? I was right. Let's not... If even a shred of that hate still exists in me, somehow, I don't want to risk reawakening it. I don't know if losing consciousness is the right word for it, but I was unaware long enough for it to be a shock when I found myself laying on solid ground. Adjusting to life with only five senses took me a few moments. It took a few more to pull myself together enough to realize that for the first time in weeks, I was experiencing the familiar. The cool underground dampness. The smoky scent of rats spit-roasting over a trash can fire. The jabbering of a raving, sleep-deprived lunatic. He's back. He's back. Did you speak to them? Did you speak to God? I was laying on the cold, concrete floor of the museum basement. Ethan was standing over me his sunken eyes wide and eager. What? What is... Where are... I stammered. From my perspective, it had been, at the absolute least, years since I'd been in that basement. My head was spinning. Memories that felt several lifetimes old came flooding back. I was Benjamin Groker. I'd been assaulted in my basement... Ethan had put a strange mask on me. I'd come down here looking for my husband, Bill. Bill! I launched myself to my feet, shoving Ethan out of the way. Bill was lying where I'd left him all those years, all those minutes ago. He wasn't moving or talking, but he was, thank Christ, still breathing. I vaguely remember Ethan screaming questions at me as I tried to pick Bill up, to carry him to safety, to put this damn nightmare behind us. I remember Ethan shoving his weight into me, Bill's weight sliding off my shoulders as the younger man wrestled me to the ground. I remember him punching me, and I remember punching back. There are some vague flashbacks to him pleading. There's also, of course, the faint recollections of my fist pounding into his face, over and over, until my knuckles connected with wet concrete. I have glimpses of knowing that Riley was still there, that he was there when we left still, that he didn't try to stop us, that he only wanted to sit and hold the mask tightly to his chest. That's about it, though. I had so much adrenaline flowing through me that my mind didn't really start jotting memories down until I'd managed to drag Bill into the car and drive halfway down the street. I managed to rouse him enough to walk just, but getting him to climb the ladder was a challenge. We made it, though. Somehow. It was when I'd finally managed to stop screaming into the steering wheel and drive away that I got my proof. My horrifying confirmation that what happened wasn't some kind of hallucination. I wish it had been. 
More than anything, I wished it had been the product of schizophrenia or a terminal brain tumor. No such luck. Vans had pulled up to the museum while I was screaming, and Bill mumbled eye-roll nonsense in the seat next to me. You see, vans that were clown car filled with both swatch-looking gunmen and bumbling figures in lab coats. Even though rearview mirrors are small, and my vision was still recovering from so long without proper light, I recognized the first scientist to get out of those vans even though her young face was eager and excited, instead of terrified or angry, even though she was several years younger than what I'd last seen her. How could I mistake her? It was Fisher. Nothing else of note happens between driving as fast as I could away from Fisher and when I started writing this. I've put Bill on the couch for now, wrapped him up warm. I don't think he was, um, away for as long as I was. He doesn't have a beard, you see, although there's definitely much more fuzz on his face than what would have grown in a few hours. He's talked now, which is something. Nothing sensical, though. Mostly just saying, it's got a baby's face, over and over again. Lord knows what the mask showed him, what he saw in the few minutes before I caught up to him in the basement. Whatever it was, it broke him. Am I intact? No, truth be told. I can already feel the breakdown coming. My leg hasn't stopped shaking for half an hour, and seeing through the white spots in my vision to write this is a challenge. All I want to do is curl up next to Bill and weep for a thousand years. We don't have a thousand years, though, do we? Seeing Fisher means I can't hide from it. If she hadn't shown up, maybe I could have pretended everything I saw was some kind of mental fabrication, the birth song of a long, dormant imagination, but no. She had to be real, didn't she? That means the rest of it must be, too. Fuck. The mask took me through time. I think I've been to the future, and there's not much of it left to travel. I think. No, not think. I know that I've seen the end of the universe. I've seen a lot of other things, too. But the destruction of everything is the only part of whatever the fuck just happened I can actually wrap my head around. If I'm not completely insane by tomorrow morning, then maybe... Maybe I can start piecing together the rest of what I saw, what I heard, what I learned. That's a problem for tomorrow's Benjamin Groker, though. If the consciousness behind those eyes can still be called that by then, at least. For now, I'm going to wrap Bill's arms around me and sob into his chest until I fall asleep. It's been years since he held me, or it feels that way, at least. I've earned this. I'm owed it. Go and hold your loved ones. Pull them to you so tight your ribs start to hurt. Hug them until you can't breathe, and then hug them harder still. Never let them go. Ever. You've got a few years left with them at most. Use them wisely. <laughs>